respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an honor, it's a privilege to be here with you today. And I won't take too much of your time, inshallah, the few minutes that we have in front of us. <clears throat> I'm also feeling quite tired. I actually was in another place today in London where I had a dars for about four to five hours, which just finished at Maghrib time. Um, the topic that we have in front of us, and all of you, or most of you, or some of you may have seen the poster, the title, obligation to the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This religion, this deen, shall we say, because religion is actually a not a right term or a translation of the word deen. This deen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with and has given us, we should be extremely thankful to Allah, of course. But what is this deen? Islam, the sharia, what is it? Unfortunately, we live in a time where Muslims from different backgrounds and from different cultures, from different communities, have their own understanding of the word deen. They have their own idea of the word Islam. Many of us, we have our own conceptions or understandings of what Islam really requires us to do or not to do. Some of us, we consider Islam maybe, Islam is to worship Allah, come to the masjid and offer five time prayers. Some of us restrict Islam to just externally dressing like a Muslim. Some of us, we think Islam is just about the heart and be a good clean hearted person. Some of us, we think it's just external worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many of us, we restrict Islam to certain different areas or different modes or forms of worship or different rituals. Sometimes, some of the cultural practices are given the name Islam and Sharia. Whereas if we look at what really Islam is, we look at the teachings of Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the Quran and Sunnah, we see that Islam is not restricted to some of the things that we think Islam is only about. And rather sometimes we see that Islam has nothing to do with what we as or what our culture may consider to be part of Islam. Many things, it depends what culture or background you're from. All different cultures from the Asian subcontinent to the Arab world, people consider certain aspects of Islam which they consider it, them in those aspects to be part of Islam, but they have nothing whatsoever to do with Islam. So we have our preconceived idea, we, our own understanding, what's coming from our parents of forefathers and forefathers. We need to really realize and understand what Islam is. And we have to act upon Islam in its entirety. Have belief in Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then we must act upon all the rules and injunctions of Islam. Islam is a religion or a way of life which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with and Allah says in the Quran Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu dukhulu fi silmi kaffa O you who believe enter Islam in, uh, enter into Islam kaffatan totally completely wholeheartedly do not take parts of Islam and leave other parts act upon Islam totally don't just become a part-time Muslim don't only become a half-time Muslim a partial Muslim Imagine a football team, you know, coming and playing half, half, one half of the game and, and not turning up for the other half. Exactly the same example for the person, for the individual who is only a partial Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do you believe in parts of the book and you overlook other parts of the book? Islam is a complete way of life. It's very unfortunate in this day and age that we find people just picking parts of Islam and just acting upon them and considering them to be good practicing Muslims. And we see flaws and neglect in many other areas. Islam is a complete way of life. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu dkhulu udkhulu fi silmi kafatan Enter into Islam completely and do not follow the footsteps of shaitan. Do not follow in the footsteps of Satan. So Islam is a complete way of life. It's not restricted to certain modes of worship. 
It's not just about Hajj and Umrah. It's not just about fasting in the month of Ramadan. It's not just about coming to the masjid five times a day. It's not just about externally dressing like a Muslim. It's not just about keeping a beard. It's not just about wearing a hat. It's not just about praying Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. Islam has much more and has more, much more to do with just dressing like a Muslim or just offering your prayer. It's a complete way of life and we must ensure that we become complete believers. And there are many different aspects. The ulama have actually discussed the different aspects of Islam. They've divided the laws, the injunctions, the rules of Islam into many different categories. The scholars, the early scholars, they've actually looked at the Quran and Sunnah and they've, they've categorized the various rules and injunctions, the awamir and the nawahi, the do's and the don'ts, the commands and the prohibitions into five different categories. And we have different ca these five categories. And one of the, the first category is aqeedah, of course. A Muslim has to first have correct belief and the correct aqeedah. And that's one category, one branch of the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah. One branch of the teachings of Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One branch of the guidance of Islam. But that's just one branch. After that, we have four branches. Aqeedah is to do with the mind, to do with our belief, what we must believe in. But we have other branches. We have four other main branches of Islam. And these, all the rules, all the injunctions, all the commands, do's and don'ts, the commands and prohibitions, they can be f fit into, we, we can fit them in, into these four categories. After aqeedah, we have ibadat, we have mu'amalat, we have mu'ashara, and we have akhlaq. These are the fain, four main categories. Ibadat is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One branch of the teachings of Islam is to worship Allah. Now, everything that's to do with worshipping Allah, comes into this category. Everything that's to, to do with worshipping Allah. From offering our salah, wudu, ghusl, and we offer our five-time prayers, and all the different nawafil and the sunan that we offer, and all the dhikr that we do, and all the recitation of the Quran that we do, and the i'tikaf in the month of Ramadan, and fasting, and salatul taraweeh, and qiyamul layl, and tahajjud prayer, and, and also zakat, which is also considered to be ibad, from the ibadat category, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hajj and umrah and fasting. All of this, all the rules relating to these aspects come into the category or into the branch ibadat. That's only one quarter, only one quarter of the teachings of Islam. Imagine a person, an, a, an individual who is extremely punctual with his five-time prayers. He performs wudu in the best of manners. He performs his ablution in the best of ways according to the method of the sunnah. And he ensures that he comes to the masjid five times a day. I'm not disregarding this, it's important of course. But imagine this individual. He comes to the masjid five times a day. He is there in the first saf, in the first row. He is there, he comes before adhan or just after adhan. And he's worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Perfect with his sunan, with his nawafil, with his ishraq prayer, with his awabin prayer, with his qiyamul layl, with his tahajjud, and his adhkar and the dhikr, and the recitation of the Qur'an, daily recitation of the Qur'an. And this person, in the month of Ramadan, he's extremely punctual with his fasting, and even outside his fasting. And he performs i'tikaf, the spiritual retreat in the last 10 days. And he is going to hajj, performing hajj, alhamdulillah, every other year or after every few years. Maybe every year in Ramadan, he's going for Umrah and visiting the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This person, the one I've just described in front of you, if he is neglectful despite doing all of this, if he is neglectful in how he deals with other people, how he deals if he's a man, how he deals with his wife and his children. If it's a wife, how she deals with her husband. Parent, if he's a parent, then how he deals with his children. If, if he or she is a child, then how he or she deals with the parents and relatives and cousins and relations and people around you. Muslims, non-Muslims, even animals, how he deals with people, how he does his business, his trade, his finance, how his dealings are. If he is neglectful, he doesn't look at the teachings of Islam. He doesn't care. He thinks Islam is just okay. Look, I look like a Muslim. Alhamdulillah. I wear a nice thobe and I've got a good beard and I wear a scarf and I, oh, I wear an amama and I look like a good Muslim. I am there in the masjid five times a day. People say to me, you know, mashallah, Shaykh, Haji Sahib, whatever, because I look like a Muslim. You can be deluded. You can be deceived. It's actually very scary. You know why? Because some of the scholars have said that if a person externally 
dresses like a Muslim. It's actually sometimes worse. Remember, it's important to even do these things, you know, be ibadat is important. But sometimes what happens when we act and behave like practicing Muslims in terms of how we worship, we are frequenting the masjid, the house of Allah, and we dress like Muslims, people consider us to be good Muslims, practicing Muslims. When people start calling us good Muslims and consider us good Muslims, we, in, within ourselves, sub, subconsciously, we consider ourselves to be practicing Muslims as well. We don't realize that we're actually committing major sins in the aspects of how we treat our family members or relatives or other people, how we deal in the marketplace, in the factory, in the shop. So we forget, we actually don't, because you know when someone, people, how they you know, uh, consider us, that's how we start thinking about our own selves. So we don't think we are committing any sins. And we don't, there's no, uh, you know, desire to even repent to Allah. We don't make tawbah. Whereas if a person is neglectful in how he is externally, but his mu'amalat, his actions are in accordance with the teachings of Islam, how he treats people, it's, it's in accordance with the teachings of Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, people won't con normally won't consider you to be a good practicing Muslim. You'll feel guilty. You'll think, yes, you know, I, I'm not punctual with my prayers. I need to repent. A day will come, inshallah, when you will repent and you will become a good Muslim in other areas as well. Because when people don't regard you as a good Muslim, then you feel guilty and bad. But when people look at you and you dress like a Muslim, then we think, yes, I'm a good practicing brother. We don't even see our own faults. One of the great scholars of the, of the subcontinent, Shaykh Mawlana Ashraf Lithani, rahimallah, he mentioned a small you know, anecdote where he said there was an old man. There was this old man who was really old and he was getting close to his death. He had a disease which was greed. And he was a very greedy person, very stingy, uh, a miserly person. He used to gather all the you know, wealth and dinar and dirham or the rupees or whatever they had in the subcontinent at that time. And he used to hoard it and gather it and hide it in different bags under his bag, bed. So the young children you know, in his community, they knew that this guy is a bit tight, in other words. So let's go and they used to go and you know, tease him. So one day all these young children came to him and said, you know, uh, granddad or uncle or whatever, you know, give us some sweets, you know, you've got some things hidden under your bed and you know, what's in that bag? Come on, you need to open that bag, you've hidden something there. He said, go, go, there's nothing here. So they were teasing him. So he said, let me just use, uh, let, let, let me, you know, think of an idea. So he just said, haven't you heard children? They said, what? Such and such person down there, he's giving, distributing free sweets. Halwa and mitai and sweets is giving free sweets. Go down there. So where? So don't you know there, there's a free distribution of sweets? So all the children said, so it's a sweet, sweet. So they all started running. So this old man, he looked at them, he started running as well. So somebody said to the old man, what's wrong with you? You, you just made this up. You know, they're running, so why are you running? He said, if they're all running, maybe it's true. You know, there might be somebody actually giving sweets. He mentioned this and he said, this is the, the example of the person whom is, who is such, he knows he is bad, he is sinful, he is guilty, but everybody says, MashaAllah, Shaykh, Haji Sa, whatever, then you get deluded. This person became deluded, he saw that all the children running, so he was deceived, he knew the reality, that he is, he, that it, you know, he just made it up, but because he saw the children, he said, maybe it's true. Exactly the example of the person who himself knows the reality that he is sinful, she is sinful, guilty, and neglectful of the teachings of Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But when everybody says, MashaAllah, 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 Shaykh this and Shaykh that, then you start thinking, yes, I may really be a Shaykh. And that's dangerous. That's why, you know, these ideas of, you know, long introductions are not, not a good idea. I mean, just facts and figures is fine. So people know, you know, where, where you've studied and where you've, whom you've taken from. Uh, Imam Ibn Sirin rahimahullah radiya anhu, Imam Tirmidhi mentions this at, at the end of his Shama'il where he said, you know, um, Inna hadha al-ilma deenun falyandur ahadukum amman ya'khudu deena. This affair of ours, this, it's deen, it's very important. Let one of you be very careful from, who you, from whom you take your religion. So we should not be taking our religion from every Tom, Dick and Harry and anybody who, can, who, who seems like someone who's knowledgeable. So therefore, introductions where we have facts and figures, who the shuyukh are and who the teachers are and where you studied, fine, alhamdulillah. But extortionate praise, it gets to the heart. 
And when people really start considering you something, then you actually forget that you're, you're sinful and you're guilty and you're just a human being. So, this is the reason why we have to be very careful, Ex especially if we are externally portraying ourselves to be good Muslims. We dress like good Muslims, we practice the external aspects of Islam, then we must be extremely careful that our mu'amalat and our transactions and our dealings and our behavior, our conduct towards others is, you know, up to date. These are the branches of Islam. Aqeedah, and then I said the four branches, so ibadat, that person I was describing. All salat and zakat and hajj and umrah and fasting and wada'if and istighfar and tasbihat and salutations and blessings and salawat on the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and everything. But this individual, he's neglectful of how he deals with his family members and his relatives and fellow Muslims. Then this person is actually just acting upon one quarter of Islam. He's a quarter Muslim. The one I've just described, imagine. 15 minutes before Salat, he is in the masjid. Quarter, just a quarter of Islam. Why? Because from the four branches, he's only acted upon one branch. The other three branches, we have number two, Mu'ashar and Mu'amalat, second and third. And I want to just talk about briefly Mu'ashar and Mu'amalat. So we have Mu'ashara, which is the branch that deals with social conduct. Mu'ashara. And we have Mu'amalat financial dealings and the fifth and the final or four uh, the fourth one if you keep aqidah on the side is akhlaq good character so mu'ashara mu'amalat we have ibadat aqid well let's start with the first one aqidah aqaid then you have ibadat worshiping allah number three mu'ashara social rulings how you deal with your parents, how you deal with your children, how you deal with your relatives, how you deal with your husband, how your dealings are with your wife, with your children, with people around you, your workmates, your college mates, your university mates, your, 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 you know, your employer, your employee, how you deal with Muslims around you, non-Muslims around you, and even the animals. That all comes under mu'ashara. And number um, four, mu'amalat. It's from the word ta'amul which really deals with financial dealings, financial dealings, how you do business, how you do trade, how do you conduct your business, and number five, akhlaq, which is to do with the issues of the heart, ensuring that the heart is, uh, you know, free and empty from all the spiritual ailments and diseases, and the heart is adorned with good character traits, which is based, of course, on the Quran and Sunnah. So now, this is what Islam is. Let's just look at these two branches in the time that we have in front of us. Mu'ashara and Mu'amalat. I just want to briefly give you a, a small synopsis of the branch category of Mu'ashara and Mu'amalat. From the five branches, Aqeedah, that's a topic on its own. Ibadat, that's worshipping Allah. We have Mu'ashara, Mu'amalat and Akhlaq. I'm going to leave Akhlaq out as well because that's a category on its own. Mu'ashara and Mu'amalat. Just briefly, we have the branch of Islam which is Mu'ashara. Mu'ashara, it's an Arabic term, it's from the word Ishra. Ishra means to live. It means living with people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us in such a way that we have to live. We have to live with people. Right? We all have to. We can't just go in a jungle and live by our own selves. We have to, we have to live. And as humans, because we have to live with people, there'll be conflicts. There'll be people around us. We live in a family. We live at home. We have parents, children, husband, wife, grandchildren, nephews, nieces. We have people around us. We have relatives. We have cousins. We live in a community, in the locality. We come to the masjid. There are people around us. We, we, we deal with people in the community. So, ishara, mu'ashara is to live with people. And there are rules in Islam connected to mu'ashara. Mu'ashara means, means to live because you have to live with people. And the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us is that we are all different. There are differences. Even the way Allah has created us, there's a difference. No two human beings live. Sorry, no two human beings look the same. No two human beings have been created the same. Every single one of you here looks different from the other. Each one of us here, we are different from the, the other. That's the way Allah has created us. Even to the point that even, you know, our fingerprints are different. You go to 
some places like if you travel to America right now they, they take you in the taker you know your print of your thumb every human beings you know uh, fingerprints different from another that's the way Allah's created us even even the lines on the hand are different one human being from the other now we live with one another but we've been created differently our thoughts are different the way we think is different the way we see things is different the way we understand issues of life is different now if you put these two things together we have to live with people and the way we see things and we think about things and the way we look at life our perspective on lives different the natural consequence and the natural result is that there'll be difference of opinion right feelings will be hurt because you, the other person who you are living with if you're a husband your wife will not do things like the way you want 100 percent otherwise you'd be living with your own self you know your wife is different she's another human being she has a different understanding a different brain she has different understanding of the world. Your children have been created differently from you. So Allah has created all of us differently, yet we have to live together. The natural consequence and the result is that our feelings will be hurt. What do we do? Do we fight and argue about that? No. Islam says that this is, this is the test. Living with people, despite being different from, from one another, that's the test. This, that's the test in this dunya. How do we deal with these differences? If someone hurts our feeling, then do we get angry? Do we retaliate? Or do we have sabr and patience? And this is the reason why there's a hadith in the Sunan of Imam Al-Tirmidhi where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Mu'minu alladhi yukhalitu al-nasa wa yasbiru ala adahum khayrun min al-Muslim alladhi la yukhalitu al-nasa wa la yasbir ala adahum. The believer who lives and mixes and interacts and intermingles a believer who intermingles with others and then exercises sabr and patience on, on the harms and difficulties that he receives from other people is far better than a believer who doesn't mix with people, who doesn't live with people, who doesn't intermingle and that's why he doesn't have to exercise sabr. What the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying in this hadith that you, you can have two people. One person says, okay, you know what, I won't live with anybody. I'll just go and live by myself in, on the north, in, in North Pole or in the South Pole or somewhere. You know, I'll just live on the top of a mountain. Of course, you know, telling a blind man, don't commit sin with your eyes, don't look at nudity. You know, blind man, of course, I mean, he can't see anyway. So, if a person goes and lives by himself somewhere, it's very easy if he says, you know what, I don't harm nobody. Who's there to harm? <laughs> Imagine, you know, my hukuk ibad, you know, I fulfill, there's nothing, I don't harm nobody. There's nobody around you. That's not the test. And that's why the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said in the hadith, Al-Mu'minu alladhi yukhaliqu nas In the sunan of al-Imam al-Tirmidhi radiallahu an. A mu'min, a believer who mixes, intermingles with others and then has sabr and patience on the harms that he is receiving is better than the one who doesn't mix with people and doesn't have to exercise patience and sabr. So we have to live with people. At home as well, we have to ensure, brothers and sisters, it's not enough that we come into the masjid and we just offer our prayers and we act like Muslims. Are we Muslims at home? Mu'ashara. You know, are we, are we Muslims at home? We could be the most pious of individuals in the masjid. But we, we go home and we don't treat our family well. As a husband, we don't treat our wives well. And some of us, we use Islam to oppress and suppress our women, which, is, which has nothing to do with Islam. Oppression and dhulm, is, it's, it's a major sin in Islam. Allah says, وَعَاشِرُوهُنَّ بالمعروف. Again, the word عِشْرَ عَاشِرُوهُنَّ بالمعروف. Treat them honorably. Treat your women, your wives in an honorable way. فَإِنْ كَرِهْتُمُوهُنَّ شَيْئًا فَعَسَىٰ أَنْ تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَيَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ فِيهِنَّ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا You might dislike something of theirs, but there is much good in them. Every human being, every human being is a combination of good and bad. To the point that the scholars say that even a stopwatch, or a, sorry, a, a watch, a watch where, which is not working, the batteries have stopped working, that clock, if this clock, there's no batteries in it. We'll say the truth two times in 24 hours. 
They'll give you the truth on two occasions. If it stops now, 8.15 now, and then 8.15 in the morning, it'll tell you the truth. Every human being has something, at least two good things to offer. And that's why a husband should realize sometimes that, okay, the wife is, you know, she's not doing this, she's not doing that, she doesn't have these qualities. But there are many good qualities that you can think about and overlook the bad qualities. And this is why Allah is saying, فَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شِيْئًا وَيَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ فِيهِنَّ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Allah has placed great good in them. And the problem today that we see is that sometimes the man, the husband wants his wife to become exactly like him. The way I think, you must think like me. What I eat, you must like that as well. How I do things, you... she's a different human being. Allah has not created her like you. She's different. You can't expect your wife to become, you know, totally like the way you want things to, to, to take place. We have to learn to overlook and forgive. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually mentioned in one hadith, Al-Mar'atu khuliqat min dhil'in A woman is created from a rib. And the rib, the nature of the rib is that it's crooked. Some people use this hadith to, to condemn women. It's not a, a condemnation. It's actually pointing to the reality that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling the man that look, your wife is different from you. From your perspective, for you she might look bent, but she's, it's not that she's... The beauty in a woman, the beauty in a rib is, is the crookedness. Which means that a woman is more fragile, more gentle, more emotional. So learn to live. And that's why the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that وَإِن ذَهَبْتَ تُقِيمَهُ كَسَرْتَ If you try to straighten, to straighten the rib, you'll break it. If you try to make your woman, your wife, she's emotional, she's, she's fragile, she's gentle, she's sensitive. And you try to change that, you'll break it. You'll, you might have, end up in a divorce. Because that's the beauty of a woman. If, she's just, if, if a woman is not sensitive and gentle and, and you know, emotional, then she's not a woman. You know, then you should have married some, some man or something. <laughs> no, you shouldn't, of course not. But this is the beauty of a woman. And you know, we always remember the hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that they have they naqisatu aqlin wa deening. They, they have, you know, they are deficient half aql and half brain. What does that mean? If, okay, if they have half a brain, then you should have double than her. You should have two times more sabr and more patience. You should be thinking more, two times more. You should have more reflection in your mind. A woman is, she's naqisatul aql. So these are the things that a man, as, as a husband, must realize. وَعَاشِرُوهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ إِسْتَوْصُوا بِالنِّسَاءِ خَيْرًا The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that I advise you sincerely to treat your women in an honorable way. لا يجلد أحدكم امرأته جلد العبد فلا فلا يضاجعها من آخر يومه. Do not strike your women. You know you strike your women and then at the end of the day in the night then you become all lovey dovey with her. This is the you know meaning of the hadith of the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم. Treat them well. As a Muslim, it's not enough that you just you know dress like a Muslim. And in the masjid, you come and at home you go and you become like some kind of a boss that nobody can even speak to you. Your children. Treat your children with love. We need to treat our children with love and with attention, with care. One of the sheikhs used to say that, uh, you know, somebody came to him and he said, you know, when I go home, my family members, my children, my wives, they can't even, when I come, everybody is so, he was so proud of the fact that, you know, when I go home, there's so much awe and there's so much respect that, you know, everybody, they can't, people can't even move. He said, why? When you go home, do you become some kind of an animal or a tiger or something? That's not what Islam requires. Islam requires that when a man goes home, then, then he gives the rights, the hukuk to his children, to his wife, to his children. And shows that love and mercy, even with young children. Look at the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not just his own children, but children of the community. كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يزور الأنصار. He would go and visit the people of Ansar. ويسلم على صبيانهم ويمسح رؤوسهم. He would greet, he would make salam to the children of Ansar. First, imagine this is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is initiating Salaam. A small child comes, he is doing Salaam first. Not that I'm an adult, what is this, this kid? Hey, get out of the masjid, too much, you know, messing around. Even the way we, we tell our children how to behave in the masjid should be full of love and mercy. And that's how we bring the hearts, they start loving Islam. 
Because nowadays dating Islam is just all about just people telling us off. It's just all about, you know, don't do this, don't do that, get out, this, that. No, we need to, we need to show love to our children. Look at the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yazurul Ansar Yusallimu ala Sibyanim. He would greet them first, وَيَمْسَحُ رُؤُوسَهُمْ And he used to place his hands over their heads. The way he treated his son, uh, his grandchildren, Sayyiduna Al-Hasan and Hussein radiallahu anhuma, both of them. You know, there's a hadith where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa was lying on the floor on the ground and one of them, Hassan Hussein, was, you know, he was holding the hands and his feet were on the feet of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa feet and then he was climbing, climbing until he climbed onto the chest of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and then the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa brought him close. He said, iftah faka, open your mouth and then he kissed him on his mouth sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would pray salah and they used to jump over him in salah with one hand. Imagine in salah, now my salah, you know, I'm worshipping Allah. This is the messenger of Allah. Whose salah is better than the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa salah? In his prayer, one of them's on the you know, back and one on the shoulder and they're jumping and climbing over him. With one hand, he places them down gently and then he goes into sujood and then he sits down. Because these are small children. This is the love that the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam would show, even with children and even the women wives. I mean, the wives, the women are listening as well. They shouldn't get away with it as well. You know, with your husbands, the tongue. The women have this problem with the tongue. You can recite all the Quran all day long and do all the adhkar and tasbihat and istighfar, and one usage of the tongue will put you right down. The, the hadith about the tongue وَهَلْ يَكُبَّ النَّاسُ فِي النَّارِ عَلَىٰ وُجُوهِهِمْ إِلَّا حَصَائِدُ أَلْسِنَتِهِمْ Nothing places a person deep into hellfire except the sins of the tongue. إِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَا يَتَكَلَّمُ بِالْكَلِمَةِ مَا يُلْقِي لَهَا بَالًا A servant sometimes says something with his mouth, he doesn't really think it's that important. But with that, one statement يَزِلُّ بِهَا إِلَى النَّارِ مَا أَبْعَدَ مَا بَيْنَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ He goes so deep into the fire of hell, the distance which is between east and west. Tongues, women especially, men as well, but especially women, they need to protect and safeguard their tongue. The sins committed by the tongue, backbiting, which is a major sin in our community. People don't even realize, the people who are practicing, seriously, people who consider themselves to be practicing backbiting, غيبة, الغيبة أشد من الزنا. This is not a hadith, but it's a saying of the early Salaf. But the meaning is true. Ghiba is, ba- is more severe than even zina. Hukukul ibad, muqaddamun ala hukukillah. The rights of the servants of Allah come before the rights of Allah. Imagine, you know, sometimes women, they're, they're just in Ramadan, they're reading, Ya Yuhal Ladina, Manu, the Quran, and suddenly phone. Okay, let, let me just pray, pray. This is. Pick up the phone. Oh, yeah, did you hear about her daughter in law? Yeah, yeah, the mother in law. Oh, yeah, oh, she's a very bad daughter in law. Yeah, yeah, she doesn't do anything. Mind your own business. You know, all your khatam, Quran recitations, gone down the drain with one statement that you've talked about someone in an evil way. And that's why these, you know, free minutes that we have on our mobile phones, they're disastrous. That's why I say, you know, I normally call these minutes, you know, 100 or 500 or 1000 free riba minutes. You know, 500 tail-bearing minutes. That's what they are. If we don't utilize them in the right manner. Ghiba, it's a severe sin. The, mess- the Quran says, Surah Al-Hujarat is full of mu'ashara. The best or the most important um, ruku' or the surah you can read. We should actually learn the surah, the meanings of it. Have a dars on it. Surah Al-Hujarat, Allah gives us rules of how to... How to you know, deal with one another in terms of the rules of mu'ashara. Ya yuhalladheena amanu in ja'akum fasiqum binaba in fatabayanu. O believers, when someone comes with, to you with the news, fatabayanu, which means tathabbatu, verify the authenticity of the news that somebody is coming to you with. If someone comes to you and says, oh, he said this, or she said this, fulan said this, such and such person said this, don't make a hasty decision. فَتَبَيَّنُوا Ensure, make sure, verify the authenticity. Many of the problems that, that we find in our community, and this, you know, conflicts, that's another topic. I actually, actually, last year in Ramadan, I gave a whole series of talks, whole Ramadan, family disputes, causes and solutions. We looked at 10, 10 different reasons that contribute to the family conflicts. Because we find every family, more or less, you know, everywhere in the world there are conflicts. We talk about global conflicts. We've got conflicts in our own homes. If we can't solve those conflicts, how are we going to solve the whole world? We can't live with one another in the family. 
And it's one of the major problems. Again, I talk to so many people. It's every, more or less every family. There's conflicts, brother with a brother, father with a son, son with a sister, brother, sister, relative, uncle. They're not talking to them and this person's not talking to that person. And there are disputes within the family. And that's why I actually made, uh, you know, we did a whole series on and mentioned, covered 10 major reasons of family disputes and the solutions. I can't even remember the list right now. But one of the reasons was this. That uh, one of the reasons was this, yes, uh, in we don't verify the authenticity of the information that people come to us with. Allah says, أَن تُصِيبُ قَوْمًا بِجَهَالَةٍ فَتُصْبِحُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلْتُمْ نَادِمِينَ Don't be hasty in what you do, because if you go ahead and do something, then you might regret the situation later on. أَن تُصْبِحُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلْتُمْ نَادِمِينَ this is one of the major causes of family disputes. We don't verify authentic. We don't. We don't. We do not verify the authenticity of what people are telling us. We believe everyone and anyone. And then Allah talks about this more in the next few verses. Ya yuha ladina amanu shtanibu kathira min al-dhan. O you who believe, avoid kathira much suspicion. Shtanibu kathira min al-dhan. Avoid much suspicion. Suspicion, you know, suspecting people. We see, okay, you know, mm, she's like this, or he's like that, or she's doing this, or she's doing that, or he's doing this. Avoid, it's a sin. Some suspicion is sin. Suspecting people without any proof. Whatever that, uh, you know, suspecting is about. Whatever it may be. Suspecting people of things which we, we do not know whether they have actually committed or not. A major sin. And then Allah says, وَلَا تَجَسَّسُ Somebody might say to themselves that, look, you know, this is the order, the hikmah, the wisdom, amazing, you know, tartib and order that Allah has used in this verse, in these few verses. Allah says, avoid suspicion. Don't suspect people on... Uh, you know, without any proof. Somebody might say, okay, you know what, I will, um, I won't suspect someone baseless suspicion. I'll, I will go and verify. I'll make sure. I, I, will, I will go and research. Don't suspect someone that he's done this sin or he's done this black magic or he's done this thing or he's done that or she's done this. Don't suspect. So somebody says, you know, oh, he's guilty of this or this sinful activity. Somebody might say to themselves, I will go and research, investigate. As soon as that thought comes, Allah straight away says, Wala tajassasu. Do not become a jasus. Do not become a spy. Do not spy. You do not work for the FBI. Wala tajassasu. That's not your job. This is what Allah is telling us, seriously, that it's not our jobs to go and look into the affairs of people who's guilty of what sin. We are taking, you know, Allah's job. That's not our job. We have husnul dhan good opinion about people every time we see someone even if we think they might may be guilty of something islam says it's from the worship of allah to have good opinion it's a very important quality to have to have good opinion you see someone may be doing something there's 101 reasons you know you see someone just walking past or coming out of uh, uh, a, uh, for example a pub they might have just gone there to ask the time. They might have, think about all these things. Or they might have just suddenly wanted to go and use the washroom, toilet, or, or they went to ask some directions, or they went to do this, or they... Make excuses for, for your fellow Muslim brother or sister. This is what Islam says. But we go the opposite way. You know, even if there's more possibility of that person not committing something, we actually make our mind up. We see someone, we start suspecting them. Hmm, yeah, this person like this, like that, like that. When you see a Muslim, we have 101 thoughts in our mind. Every time we see someone, hmm, it's from that group, it's from this group, it's from that mosque, it's from that community, it's this, it's Sufi, it's Salafi, it's Wahhabi, it's this, they open this, this, um, this guy, his aqidah is corrupt, or his HT, or FT, or ST, or TJ, or I don't know what. 101 thoughts. And we will, will give him such a look. Seriously, you know, fellow Muslims, we give them looks as though, you know, they're not even human beings. And then we turn to a non-Muslim and say, Hi, how are you, everything, you know, we smile. At least it's better than a non-Muslim, even though if it's from another group. 
We are good with non-Muslims, but when it comes to Muslims, he's from this group and that group, at least smile, at least give the salam of Islam. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of his sunnah was to smile at people. Jarir ibn Abdullah al-Bajari radiallahu anhu states, مَا حَجَبَنِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمُ مُنْذُ أَسْلَمْتُ وَلَا رَآنِ إِلَّا تَبَسَّمَ فِي وَجْهِ Since I became a Muslim, since I embraced Islam, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never kept or placed a barrier between myself and himself and never did he see me except that he smiled in my face. And this is one Sahabi saying, Imagine the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would smile with every single Sahabi and that's why the companions would think, they would consider that they were the most close, they were the closest to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One Sahabi, I think it was Amr ibn al-As, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu, if I remember correctly, he went to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, Messenger of Allah, who is the most beloved to you, me or Abu Bakr? He said, Abu Bakr. He said, then who? He said, Umar. Then he said, after Thumma man, after that who? He said, Uthman. So he said, I just stopped there, I didn't want to get more disappointed. Because <laughs> I really thought he would have said I was the most closest to him, because that's how I felt. And then at least number two, and at least number three, if not, then I just stopped. Now he actually really thought that he was the closest to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because that's how the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would make his companions feel. He would give them that love and attention. And this is the akhlaq and the character of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Unfortunately, we live in a time, seriously brothers, you know, we, we, we restrict Islam to rigidness and strictness and harshness. And we reserved, we think it's part of Sunnah to be reserved. Where does that Sunnah come from? It's contrary to the teachings of Islam. You become some important person in, his, in, in the Muslim community, like, like, like a sheikh or someone like, you know, and that's it. We think, that's it, we're, we're up there on cloud seven and we're harsh and you know, everybody, you know, we can't even smile. Look at the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He would be one of the people. He would sit with the people. He would sit with the people when a non-Muslim or somebody from the, uh, you know, from the, the mushrikun would come and ask the Sahaba, Man minkum Muhammad, they would, they would need to ask, who is Muhammad amongst you? We can't recognize Muhammad. There's one incident when somebody, one of the, uh, you know, someone from the opposite army came and asked, he said, Man minkum Muhammad? You know, the, he asked the Sahaba companions, who is Muhammad amongst you? So the other person said, can you see that person there? This one who's quite, fleck, uh, quite uh, um, white in, uh, uh, in his complexion. The one who's just leaning against that, uh, that wall. That's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa This is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah says in that verse of Surah Al-Hujarat, اجتنبوا كثيرا من الضن Avoid suspicion, do not suspect people. That's one of the main reasons why we have all these conflicts in the family. Because we start suspecting people of things without any concrete <laughs> evidence. And then Allah says, وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا Do not go and spy, do not become a jasus. That's not your job. Do not go and investigate and research and look into the private affairs and matters of people. Yes, there are exceptions, like for the police in an Islamic country or when they're looking for crime. There are exceptions, but generally that's not our job. Rather, rather, our job is that even if we see someone guilty of something, man satara aiban satara Allahu uyubahu yom al qiyamah, when someone hides and conceals the faults of others, Allah will concede his faults on the day of judgment. We all have faults. We are, we are, we have a responsibility of of concealing the faults of other people. So Allah says, wala tajassasu. Do not go and spy. Do not go and look into the private affairs of other people, that's not your job. Then somebody might think, this is the tartib and the order of Surah Al-Hujarat. Somebody might think, look, I'm not, not going to uh, suspect, suspicion is haram. Neither I will, you know, um, go and research and investigate and look into the matters and affairs of people. What about the situation where I know for a fact this person, he's dead, he, you know, it's not suspicion. There's evidence, and the evidence is that I never had to go and search for it. It happened in front of my eyes. The brother told me himself that he did this sin last night, or he was drinking, consuming alcohol in front of me. Then what? Allah says, "Wala yagta ba'dukum ba'dah." Even if you know, do not talk about that person behind his back. Imam al-Qurtubi radiallahu anhu mentions this in his tafsir Ahkam al-Quran that the reasoning or the hikmah or the wisdom behind the tertib of these three sins. Tajassus and then, sorry, 
سوء الظن bad opinion then تجسس and then غيبة ولا يغتب بعضكم بعضا do not backbite if somebody is guilty of a sin then the duty and responsibility of a good practicing Muslim is to offer sincere nasiha and advice and guidance in the best of ways in the most gentle of manners keep on explaining our job is not to name and shame we're not there to tell people you're guilty and you're sinful no our job is that this person is musab this person has got some kind of illness someone who has a cancer we don't become angry at someone who has cancer you, you got cancer get out from here you, do we become angry with someone who has a physical ailment or a physical disease or illness or sickness no likewise this guy is spiritually ill we need to offer sincere advice nasiha guidance we, with love with attention look at the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam again his example in front of us bala arabiyun fi masjid an nabiy sallallahu alaihi wasallam a villager came into the masjid of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam started urinating in one corner the sahaba started looking at him what's this guy doing urinating in the masjid He's urinating in the masjid. Imagine in any of our masajid in the UK, somebody who just starts urinating, probably in five minutes he'll need, he will need to call an ambulance. You know why? Probably come out of the masjid with a blue and a black eye and a bruised face. Inshallah, definitely not here. But in some masjid, maybe. People will become angry. What are you doing? Don't you understand? Look at the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa He said to the sahaba radiallahu anhu, da'uhu, leave him. It's okay, let him, let him finish. Number one, let him finish. Don't stop him now in the middle of him urinating. Because two problems. One is right now he's polluting the corner. If you, start, if you stop him, he'll run there and all that you know, whole line will become polluted. And number two, medically it's wrong as well. You know, to stop someone from urinating in the middle, it's harmful for him. We can clean this up later. This is harmful for him. He said, da'uhu, leave him. And then he said to the Sahaba that afterwards go and you know, uh, pour some water and purify the place. And then afterwards the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to him, the Arabi who was a, someone who had recently embraced Islam. And in an extremely gentle, polite way he explained to him. And he said, brother, you know, this, this is a masjid. In هَذِهِ الْمَسَاجِدْ لَا تَصْلُحُ لِشَيْءٍ مِّنْ هَذَا These masajid, houses of Allah, places of worship, they are not appropriate for things like urinating. وَإِنَّمَا هِيَ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَقِرَاءَةِ الْقُرْآنِ This is for the recitation of the Book of Allah, to offer salah and to remember Allah and the recitation of the Book of Allah. Explain to him in an extremely gentle way. In another riwayah, this person said, فَمَا رَأَيْتُ Maybe this same hadith or another hadith, but I'm not exactly sure. But similar, maybe the similar instance or another incident. But after the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained to him in a very gentle way, he said, فَمَا رَأَيْتُ أَحْسَنَ مُعَلِّمًا مِنْهُ صلى الله عليه وسلم. I have never seen a better teacher than the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. These are, there are ways of teaching. There's actually a beautiful book. Shaykh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda rahimahullah, who was a very famous hadith scholar of the uh, second part of the 20th century. Ar-Rasul Al-Mu'allim صلى الله عليه وسلم. A beautiful book. It's been translated into English and I encourage all of you to pick this book up and read it. Ar-Rasul Al-Mu'allim, a prophet, the teacher, the prophet, the prophet who was a teacher, his ways and his methods of teaching. Different chapters. It's actually written in Arabic but translated into English. A beautiful book. How the Messenger وسلم, taught, especially if you're a teacher. But all of us, we have to do tarbiya of our children. So, this is, if someone is guilty of some sinful activity, our job is to give them sincere advice, nasiha, for the sake of Allah, in a very gentle way. We want them to become practicing. So we do our best to, with love, with care and attention, we, we try to treat them. We don't start spreading rumors about them. We don't start spreading the evil sin, spreading news about the evil activities. We, we have to conceal and hide the sinful activities. And I'm going back to the sisters, I was talking about the wife. You know, women at home as well. You know, they just sometimes, illa mashallah, uh, there are of course good women, but some of the women, they have this very bad habit of talking about the whole world except their own selves. Everybody is bad except your own self. It's, it's really, really uh, serious. And towards the husbands as well. I know sisters are here and they're listening. One of the most important things for the sisters is to control your tongue. How many men, husbands that I personally have spoken to, 
say this, my wife is so good, but the only thing is that she's got a problem with the mouth. She just nags, nags, nags. Just three days ago, an email came. Somebody said, you know, what do I do? She's got all the good qualities. She's praised, but she just nags too much. Seriously, sisters need to realize this will have an impact on your marriage later on. Maybe not in one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, six years, maybe 10 years down the line. Slowly, gradually, the man will start losing interest in you because of your tongue and because of your mouth and because of the way you speak. And that's why the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he talked about looking for a good wife, he said, Alaykum bil abkar fa innahunna a'adhabu afwahan wa antaqu arhaman wa arda bil yaseer. Three good qualities to look for in a wife. He said one of the good qualities is to look for a woman who is sweet-mouthed. Sweet-mouthed. And then he said the ones who are prolific in giving birth and wa arda bil yaseer, who are content and happy with less. You give them less money, they are happy. These are three amazing qualities that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prescribed in the hadith. Being sweet-mouthed, it's very important the way the woman talks. If she keeps on nagging, then it will create problems. Even on the children, some women, from the time they wake up till the time they go to sleep, they just yell. They just keep on shouting and shouting and shouting. This is not the way. A Muslim does not shout. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hadith when you look at his qualities, لم يكن سخابا He was not, not somebody who would yell. Very rarely he would yell. He would never shout. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Backbiting, tail-bearing, relating information from one place to another. The Messenger Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, لا يدخل الجنة قطات The tail-bearer shall not enter paradise. In another hadith, in the Sunan of Imam Al-Tirmidhi, he said, وَتَجِدُونَ شَرَّ النَّاسِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ ذُو الْوَجْهَيْنِ The worst of people you will see on the Day of Judgment is a two-faced person. الَّذِي يَأْتِ هَؤُلَاءِ بِوَجْهٍ وَهَؤُلَاءِ بِوَجْهٍ That individual is the worst of people on the Day of Judgment who comes to one group of people with one face and goes to another group of people with another face. You go to the mother-in-law with another face, you go to the daughter-in-law with another face. And some people, you know, that's their job, they just strike the match. They strike the match, burn, and then they run away. They start the conflict. That's their job. Islam says we should try to you know, reduce the fire. Some people, their job is nothing but to create the fire. You know, they like controversies. They like to create those you know, problems in the family. Oh, he said this, and she said this, and then they take a step back and watch everything. That's the job of shaitan. That's what shaitan does. Makes people fight and then you know sits and say yes, relax, let's watch free ticket to watch this uh, you know uh, drama taking place. And that's some communities and some families. That's what it is: it's dramas, episodes. Episode number one, episode number two. You could probably do a whole documentary or a film on on the dramas that take place in families, Muslim families, with the in-laws and the mother-in-law and the father-in-law and the sister-in-law and the uh, nephew and the you know the whole you know extended family really you can have a whole documentary series because it's a drama after drama after drama people have too much time on their hands and they just have, have nothing better to do than just can't have a fight and quarrel with one another we should get ourselves busy engage ourselves with fruitful activities those people who engage themselves with fruitful activities they don't have time for this nonsense they don't have time if if someone has a you know habit of reading books you don't have time you've got things to do you're, you're in, interested in reading books. It's a very good way of, of taking your attention away from the controversies at, at home. Get yourself busy, engaged, do activities. Just keep on doing things. So you don't get involved in all the family controversies. And seriously, those people who actually keep themselves busy, they avoid all these family controversies. So women as well, with your husbands, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a hadith, Al-mar'atu idha sallat khamsaha This is in the Sunan of Imam Tirmidhi Al-mar'atu idha sallat khamsaha Wa saama shahraha Wa ta'at zawjaha Dakhalat al-janna min ayy abwaab in sha'at A woman who offers her five time prayers and observes the fast of Ramadan and obeys her husband she will enter Jannah and Paradise from whichever door she wants There's another hadith which some of the non-Muslims they, they you know raise objections to لو كنت آمرا أحد أن يسجد لأحد لأمرت النساء أن يسجدن لأسواجهن if I was to order the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said if I was to order and uh, um, 
command anyone from prostrating, making sujood in front of another human being, then I would have commanded women and wives to make sujood and prostrate in front of their husbands. Allah has given a husband this rank. Women need to realize Allah has given this rank. You know, in a family, you have to have someone who's a boss. In a, in a family setup, you have to have someone who's an amir. Wherever there's, you know, two people equal, you have a conflict everywhere. You know, any place where you have two equal people, there's always a conflict. And that's why in a family where the woman does not consider her husband to be superior, there's going to be a conflict. But if the wife thinks he's my superior, Allah has commanded me to obey him and respect him. Respecting your husband is one of the most important duties and responsibilities. That doesn't mean that you, you take all, all the oppression that he, he uh, you know, throws you away. There are ways but respecting one's husband and then children as well, looking after them. So women really need to control their tongue. Sins of the tongue, subhanAllah, it, it's just an area where you can commit many things without even realizing. Lying, tail bearing, backbiting, false accusation, slander, swearing. You know, many sins can be committed with a tongue. You know, there was this couple where, I mentioned this once or twice as well, but there was this couple, they used to fight. And you know, you know what happens? These are all the real situations, these are all the real problems of the family. Now it is unfortunately, I'm not saying it's haram and sinful, but our reliance more than dua and asking Allah to help us and really tackling the problem and dealing with them, our reliance is more on what? Go to this sheikh, go to that sheikh, give me a ta'awiz, give me this, problems will be solved. Problems are not going to be solved like that. You have to deal with your problems. We have to do, and then if nothing, then it's black magic. It's a big problem in our community. Every problem in the family, there's one woman who's really, I've spoken to her so many times, a, you know, a glass drops in her kitchen, she thinks someone has done black magic. Seriously, because she's now mentally disturbed. Everything, black magic. I don't, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, it does. But we have to deal with these problems. We don't make tarbi of our own children. We neglect them. We're too busy earning money. We don't have time to spend with them. And we don't have time to spend with them. And we don't have time to look after them. And then when they leave the path of Islam, we say, black magic. You've done black magic yourself by not giving them good tarbiyah. This, these are problems we need to, you know, we can't blame. We like to blame other people than our, than our own selves. So these are the real issues we need to tackle them at home if there are family problems why are there family problems what's going wrong am i guilty of neglecting the rights uh, of my wife am i guilty of neglecting the huquq of my husband not that okay go to the sheikh and that's it dua will do everything you do dua as well but you also take the means asbab and dua both at the same time no ta'weez is going to just make all your family problems disappear Nothing's, no wadifa is going to make them disappear. Every time people phone me, is there something to read, family problems? I say, no, no, there's nothing to read. There's things to do. That you read afterwards. But there are things to do. You have to do these things. Then things are not just going to disappear like that. And this, so there was, there was this family, you know, uh, husband and wife, they used to have a lot of conflict, a lot of problems, a lot of fights and argumentation. So they went to this one sheikh. And they said to him that, you know, we've got this problem and, and he spoke to the husband and the wife and, and found out the, the, the problem and he realized what the problem is. They said, give us some, some wadifa, some reciting, something, you know, is there something to read or whatever, uh, you know, or give us some, you know, they took some water, you know, can you just blow on this water so we can drink. So the sheikh was trying to explain to them that, look, these are real issues that you need to tackle. You need to sort out these, sit down, discuss them, you need to change your ways. No water blowing on it, whatever you pray is just going to solve your problems. But they wouldn't take that as, you know, as an answer. They kept on persisting and insisting and saying, no, we want, you know, give us some water, you know, blow on it, read, you know, our problems will be solved. The sheikh said, okay, these guys are not listening, so let's, what shall we do? So what he did was he gave them some water. He knew what the problem was. So he gave some water and said, look, I've, I've read some verses of the Quran and some hadith, some, some dua, etc. This you, you, you need to drink. I tell you the way you need to drink. What happens, you know what, you know the, what the problem was? He realized the root of the, and the cause of their dispute was that the husband used to be outside the house and he, he used to work, as all husbands do normally outside. He used to come back stressed and you know, he, tired after a hard day's work from nine to five or nine to six job. 
he comes into the house and he's really tired he needs somebody to look after him and somebody to you know take the burden and weight over from his head but as soon as he comes the wife saying oh but that thing's not done and that thing's not done and you didn't do this and so relax you know I'm, I'm just tired you know as soon as you go in the house and the wife starts nagging like this of course it's going to cause a problem that was the main problem and then he would retaliate and that's it fight argument until they go to sleep and he just continued and carried on so the sh these people they weren't realizing uh, you know this problem so the sheikh said okay let's give you water done you know a glass of uh, you know bottle of water he said okay the husband and wife are they said look i've done some good blowing on this water i've read all sorts of stuff you have to drink this water he said to the wife this is a very spiritual you know water now the way to drink this is that as soon as your husband comes inside the house you have to take a glass and put it in your mouth and you have to keep the water in your mouth for 10 minutes how many minutes 10 minutes take your mouth full okay in your in your mouth as soon when you hear the keys that he's come inside the house water is she gonna nag 10 minutes he's also and he told him as well when you come as well when you see her once she takes water then you have to take water so you go and take as well now she's angry I have to do this nothing's happening he said you have to do this for like three to four months every day as soon as he walks into the house straight away water in your mouth there's no no conflict after three four months things started you know calming down and they came to Sheikh Allah, you gave some very good water I said yeah I know I give you very good water some of the shiuch they actually do that they just because people don't take no for an answer I know one Sheikh used to write this Taweez he used to Somebody used to come and say, write a ta'weez. I'm not saying it's haram. You know, there's a fiqh behind ta'weez, amulets. Whether it's allowed or not, you know, not everything is shirk and not everything is allowed. There's a middle way. But we shouldn't over be, uh, be over-reliant on, the, on these things. Our main means is dua, asking Allah. I mean, who's going who's gonna to solve our problems? Allah. I mean, the ta'weez itself, there's nothing in it. It's really Allah. So does Allah need a paper for, I mean, for us to put a paper? Allah, we can ask Allah with sincerity with our own words. It's enough. We don't really need that. Allah, at the end of the day, even the wazifa, remember, remember, anything prescribed from the sunnah, if the Messenger وسلم, said, such and such, read this after this prayer, without doubt, we do that. Other than that, those things that are based on experience, I'm not saying it's bid'a or anything like that, but we must not be, you know, we must not give it too much importance. Because these things, at the end of the day, who is the one who is going to change? Allah. If you ask Allah, oh Allah, you know, please, you know, this particular problem of mine, please alleviate this, you know, difficulty from me. Allah can remove that. Allah doesn't need you to read something, you to read something 346 times, you know, after Fajr and 432 times after Maghrib and make sure that it's one at night and one here and one there. Allah doesn't need all of that. Does Allah need that? Does Allah say, okay, only if you read 346, then if you do 345, it's not going to work. So ultimately it's Allah and we rely upon Allah. And we have to deal with these problems. So, going back to uh, um, this, so this is mu'ashara. Time's really flying by. I'm going to try to conclude. I'm getting tired as well now. But this mu'ashara, the way we deal with people, with Muslims around us as well. We, you see, basically the khulasa, the summary of uh, mu'ashara is the following hadith: Al Muslimu man salim al Muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadihi. This is the essence. This is the Khulasa or the summary of of acting upon the ahkam of Islam on Mu'ashara. I still need to talk about Mu'amalat by the way. I'm, I'm coming to Mu'amalat. I'm going to talk about 10 minutes on Mu'amalat by the way. So uh, that's the essence, Khulasa of Mu'ashara. We don't do anything, we don't say anything that harms anybody else. That's the Khulasa. Anyone in this hadith, Muslimun have been mentioned, but the ulama explain that this was because they used to, you know, they used to be Muslims there. Muslims, non-Muslims, even animals. We don't say anything, we don't do anything that harms any creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the khulasa and summary. Even when we go, when we worship Allah, we go to the house of Allah, we make tawaf, we want to kiss the black stone, we must not harm someone. If we are trying to kiss the black stone and we're pushing people, we'll actually come back with more sin than any good. It's sinful. That's why these rules are in place. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to wake up at night to offer Salatul 
Tahajjud and Qiyamul Layl. The hadith states, Qama Ruwaydan, he used to wake up extremely silently, on, he used to tiptoe slowly, so that his wife Aisha radiallahu anha or whoever the she was, was not harmed. Imagine the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa considering the sleep of his family. He's worshipping Allah, not like, okay, you know, praying to her children, bring the whole house down. No, you're doing good, do it. Don't disturb other people. Maybe tell them that, look, it's good if you wake up at tahajjud. But this is how the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. So even doing good deeds, whatever we do, we should make sure, brothers and sisters, that we do not say anything or we do not do anything that harms any one of the creation of Allah. Especially when we are in the eyes of the non-Muslims. We are prophetic mirrors. We are the ambassadors of Islam and ambassadors on behalf of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Unfortunately, we act people when they see us, these non-Muslims, they see us. They will not talk to and look at us that this is Zayd and Amr and Abdullah and Yusuf and whatever. These are Muslims. That's how Muslims behave. If we come to the masjid and park our cars anyway and anywhere and in any manner that we want and block all the entrances, that, that, is, that is a crime. The ulama have said that if you harm someone and worship Allah, it's actually more sinful. If a person comes for taraweeh salah and is blocking someone's entrance, once in Leicester, somebody blocked an ambulance entrance. And the guy was in the first stuff of the masjid. And they had to announce in the masjid. And he was blocking an ambulance entrance. There's a harm. You've committed a sin. Rather, you should have stayed at home. The ruling is you stay at home and pray by yourself. A person who did not offer his salah with jama'ah in congregation in the masjid is far less guilty of a sin than the one who comes and performs his salah with jama'ah but harms someone on the way. By the way he drives his car or the, by the way he's parking his car or the, by the, whatever he does. It's, it's sinful activity. You should stay at home. And this is, I'm actually not saying this from my pocket, this is based on the hadith. I have evidence for this. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said in one hadith, Man akala min hadhi shajarat al mumtinati fala yaqrabanna musallana. Man ak in another riwaya, man akala thuma wal basala, fala yaqrabanna musallana wal yaqud fi baytihi. The one who eats onion and garlic and eats distasteful things, let him forget coming into the masjid, let him not even get close to the masjid. And let him sit at home. He should sit at home. Imagine, this is what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying. Do not come to the masjid if you've eaten or consumed something that has an offensive smell to it and people around you will be harmed. Imagine if, you know, in Ramadan, what happens? We eat, especially people living close to the masjid. We quickly do iftar, whatever, half a samosa in the mouth and a pastry and a whatever, uh, pastry, whatever, and quickly half in the masjid. Allahu Akbar. And the worst crime, and I call this a crime, a person can do is have a cigarette and come into the masjid. Smoke, standing outside the masjid, quick few drinks. Wait, just offer, first of all, whether it's allowed or not, that's another question. But even if you want to smoke, then at least you've waited all day long. Offer your maghrib and then go outside when you go home. You can have it or on your way. A few drags into the masjid and you're offering salah next to someone who will be harmed. It's a crime. Rather, if you prayed maghrib on the road or at home, you would be less guilty of a sin. Less guilty, seriously. You should not come to the masjid because you are doing more sin than good by coming into the masjid and harming someone. And I've mentioned this on many occasions, I actually had to move away. In Maghrib Salah, in, in Ramadan, with somebody who had just had a cigarette and was standing next to me. And you can imagine, if you stand next to someone who's just smoked, how it's difficult for you. You know, you st it's actually worse for the other person next to you, passive smoking, as you know. I, actually, I just broke my, I just, you know, came out of my Salah. He was in the first rak'ah and the guy came next to me and I couldn't, I was coughing. I just broke it and I went to the next stuff and I started again. Somebody asked me, is this allowed? It's allowed. What can you do? You know, you can't struggle throughout your three rak'at of Maghrib prayer. So all these things we must ensure we are ambassadors for Islam. The way we drive our cars, the way we behave outside, the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we go into the shops, the way we deal with people. We should, you know, even non-Muslim, they should realize that these are angels who've been descended from the heavens. Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, radiallahu anhu, one of the great imams of this ummah, the student of al-Imam Abu Hanifa, radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him. Muhammad ibn Hassan, a great imam, 
He used to live in a locality. In his locality next door to him, there was a Jewish person, a Jew, who used to live. This Jew put his house on sale, right? He put his house on sale and the price was double. Somebody came and said, how much? He said, this is the price. Said, Why is your house double price? He said, there's two prices for this house. One price for the house and the other price is living next door to Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani. This is a Jew giving testimony that if we should be living in an area, community, locality where even the non-Muslims, they come and tell us, where are you leaving? You know, you leaving this community, this locality, you know, there's so much good by you being in this, in this community. But unfortunately, we live in a time where it's the opposite. They, they can't see the back of our faces. Yeah, they want us to go quickly because the way we do things, the way we act, the, our conduct, you know, to the point that even the noise, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi says so much huquq of our jar, the, the neighbor. There are rights of the neighbor. We should ensure at night when we're sleeping, do we, you know, we, we wake up in Ramadan, we're waking up for suhoor, but they're not waking up for suhoor. If we wake up and make a lot of noise and we're thinking, alhamdulillah, we're doing sunnah of suhoor and we're disturbing their sleep, we've actually committed a sin by waking up for suhoor. It's better that we slept through it and we missed a sunnah but we didn't commit a haram. We can't harm them. They're not Muslims. We come for tarawih salah. We can't harm people around us. The way we drive cars as well. We must drive cars in a way that Islam wants us to do. There's, there are rules of driving a car as well. There are rules. And I've mentioned this once a few times before as well. If you want to know the rule of driving a car, how do you drive a car? There's only one simple. Uh, uh, one simple way of us understanding this is that what are the rules of driving a car? If somebody asks you what, what's, what, what's the fiqh behind driving a car? You know, you want to know how to drive a car? You want to know? Yeah. Imagine for one moment if the Messenger وسلم, was driving a car, how would you drive a car? There were no cars in that time. But imagine the Messenger وسلم, behind, this, behind the wheel, steering wheel. Just imagine for one moment, how would he drive a car? How would he drive a car? How calm and composed would he be? I know it's London and I know the traffic and I know you can get really stressed out and I can imagine, I mean, you know, if you come to Leicester, it's easier, definitely. But still, we need to try to be, uh, you know, careful in the way we drive our cars as well. And then the way we park our cars. And, and so this is the khulasa and the summary about Mu'ashara. We don't do anything, we don't say anything that would harm anyone from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's Mu'ashara, and that's just like a synopsis or the khulasa. I've looked at Mu'ashara. Mu'ashara is a very lengthy topic. We need hours and hours. And likewise, Mu'amalat, but I'm tired, so I'm not going to go into Mu'amalat. Inshallah, maybe some other time when I come here, maybe we can talk about Mu'amalat. Financial dealings, business dealings, how you are as an employer, how you are as an employee, how we should not deceive people. Deception and fraud in our business. Major haram. Just two minutes on this because, you know, maybe some people might not be, might not be alive by then. Allah knows best. Allah says, the longest verse in the Quran, Ayatul Mudayana. The longest verse that Allah has mentioned in the Quran. The longest verse. Not about Salah. Not about Hajj. Not about Umrah. Not about wearing a hat. Not wearing a jubba. The longest verse in the Quran. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا تَدَايَنْتُمْ بِدَيْنٍ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّنْ فَاكْتُبُوهُ Oh, you who believe when you take a loan from someone, make sure you write it down. Loan transactions, even a penny that we owe someone and we go to Allah, we'll have to pay back on the Day of Judgment. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith, he asked the companions, أَتَدْرُونَ مَنِ الْمُفْلِسِ Do you know who a bankrupt person is? The Sahaba said, according to us, the bankrupt is the one, مَنْ لَا دِنَارَ لَهُ وَلَا دِرْهَمْ The one who doesn't have money. He said, no. The bankrupt is the one who comes on the Day of Judgment with all the good deeds, but ضَرَبَ هَذَا وَشَتَمَ هَذَا وَأَكَلَ مَا لَهَذَا وَقَذَفَ هَذَا He slandered someone, he hit someone, he consumed someone's wealth unlawfully. All his good deeds will be given to pay back these people. Even a penny, imagine. We cannot, brothers and sisters, seriously, leave this world. We must never ever be in a state where we are leaving this world and we owe a person even a penny. If someone leaves this world, it's very dangerous. Even a penny. Even a penny that we borrowed, we must pay back. Islam is very strict when it comes to mu'amalat, financial transactions, to the point that actually taking a loan is actually not even recommended. We should only take a loan when there's extreme need. It's actually khilaf al-awla and makruh, dislike to take a loan. 
unless there's a genuine need. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa used to make dua. Oh Allah, I seek your refuge from min ghalabati dayn. Part of our sunnah dua is from being overcome with, you know, debts and loans. We shouldn't take loans. And if we do, remember, if we leave this world and we haven't paid people their money, then Allah, only Allah knows what the outcome will be. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَأْكُلُوا أَمْوَالَكُمْ بَيْنَكُمْ بِالْبَاطِلِ So, the way we do our business. You know, the, one of the last surahs, and I'll end with this, in the last juz of the Qur'an, Surah Al-Mutaffifin, وَيْلٌ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا اكْتَالُوا عَلَى النَّاسِ يَسْتَوْفُونَ وَإِذَا كَالُوهُمْ أَوْ وَزَنُوهُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ أَلَا يَظُنُّ أُولَيْكَ أَنَّهُمْ مُبْعُوثُونَ What's that surah talking about? We hear it in Salatul Taraweeh, where the Imam reads it in some of the prayers. What is that surah talking about? About wearing a long hat? No, what's that surah talking about? وَيْلٌ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ Destruction be to those who commit the major sin of tatfif. What is tatfif? The surah is mutaffifin, the people of tatfif. In halatu raf'a al mutaffifun. Mutaffifin, halatu al jar. Destruction be to the people of tatfif. What is tatfif? Allah tells us then, what is tatfif? Alladheena idha katalu ala nasi yastawfoon. Those people when they take through measurement and weight, then they yastawfoon. When it's their time to take from people through measurement and weight, you're buying something, you're taking something through measurement and weight. Yes, tawfun, istifa. The word istifa means making sure every grain and every ounce, every drop, you get it, receive it. They yes, tawfun. They, you know, the word yes, tawfun is like sucking every little bit. Exactly, the, the, you know, the, the meter or the arrow, exactly to the top. A bit of space left here, fill it up. The sugar or, the, or the whatever it is, the rice. When is their time to take? Yastawfun. وَإِذَا كَالُوهُمْ أَوْ وَزَنُوهُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ But when is their time to give others through measurement and weight? يُخْسِرُونَ They give a bit less. Allah says, أَلَا يَظُنُّ أُولَئِكَ أَنَّهُمْ مَبْعُوثُونَ Don't these people recognize that they'll be resurrected? Don't these people recognize? أَلَا يَظُنُّ أُولَئِكَ أَنَّهُمْ مَبْعُوثُونَ لِيَوْمٍ عَظِيمٍ For a big day. يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ On the day where everybody, the whole of humanity, will have to stand in the presence of Allah and give answer to every action of theirs. Uh, these verses are scary. تطفيف, how many of us are careful in how we buy and how we sell? There's a hadith in Sunan, Sunan of Imam Tirmidhi which we just read a few days ago. The Messenger وسلم, said there are certain people that Allah does not even look at them. Allah will not even look at them with mercy on the day of judgment. And one of those people is Al Munfiqu Silatahu Bil Halif al Kadhib. The one who sells his items and his goods and his commodities with false testimony or with false oath. Bil Halif al Kadhib. Wallahi, it's, it, brother, it's like this. Wallahi, it's like this. Only for you. I bought it for five pounds. Only for you six. It's haram. You're lying. There's a hadith in the Sunnah of Ibn Majah where the Messenger sallallahu said, Man ba'a Mabi'an bi'aybin, something like I can't remember the Arabic words. Lam yubayinuhu, someone who sold a good and knew that it had a defect in it and did not disclose that defect will remain in the maqat, in the anger, in the wrath of Allah until he does not go and you know tell that person and take the thing back. Fraud, deception, man ghashana falaysa minna, the one who cheats is not from us, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says. Ayatul Munafiqi Thalath, the sign of a hypocrite three. When you the hadatha kadi, when you speak, you lie. Tumina Khana, when you make a promise, you break that promise. When you when you made a trustworthy person, you breach that trust. These are all things to do with nothing but Islam. That's Islam. Unfortunately, brothers, we live in a time where, you know, as I started going back to what I started my talk with, we have our own preconceived idea of what Islam is. For some people, it's nothing but tasbih and subha, you know, just long subha. For some people, it's just dressing like a Muslim. Some people, it's just, you know, Ramadan and suhoor and iftar and that's it. It's, this, is, this is not only Islam. Islam is a comprehensive way of life. From the moment we wake up till the moment we go to sleep, from the moment we're baligh, mature, till the time we go, we, we die and we pass away and we meet Allah, 
Whatever we do, there are rules of Islam. We should be a Muslim, not just in the masjid, but we should be a Muslim, a believer at home, whether in the masjid, whether on the road, whether driving a car, whether at the factory, whether at the shop. As an employer, Muslim. As an employee, Muslim. As a husband, Muslim. As a wife, Muslim. As a son, Muslim. As a daughter, Muslim. As a father, mother. Whoever we may be, whatever position we may be in, we should be Muslim and the teachings of Islam should be in our lives. I end with this, inshaAllah, and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he give us the grant us the tawfiq and the ability to practice on some of the things that were said today inshallah and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give make us all good muslims may allah give us the ability to be good muslims in our mu'ashara in our mu'amalat in our social affairs how we deal with people it's not it's not difficult but it's not it's 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 not impossible uh, sorry it's difficult but it's not impossible as well okay it's you just need a bit of uh, concentration. We just need to really hasibu an anfusakum qabla an tuhasibu. We need to do self recognizing We need to think about how our lives are running and, and where we're heading to. We just have to have this conscience all the time, every time, every day. Who we, when we talk to someone for a moment, even when something comes out from our mouth, Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu, one of the four Imams, when somebody used to come and speak to him, he would never answer. Somebody used to come speak to him, he used to look down and then after 30 seconds he would speak. Somebody asked him, oh Imam, why do you do that? Why does it take you like half a minute to talk and respond? He said, I think for a moment whether it's better for me to talk or not talk. Whether it's better for me to speak or remain silent. The Messenger said, whoever believes in Allah, on the final day, let him say that which is good or let him remain quiet. So even before we speak with anyone, it's just it's a matter of a few days of our life. We just have to be very careful. And if we do make a mistake, straight away go and ask forgiveness. No problem, inshallah, that person will forgive you. There's nobody that cruel in this world who doesn't forgive. But we need to take an initiative. We have to ask forgiveness. It's, it's, it's very easy to ask for forgiveness in this world than to pay with our good actions in the next life. We may need to be, we may have to be humble, okay, but it's, it's easy compared to what's going to happen in the Akhirah. So, inshallah, with this, I end up with the Quran. I stop for Allah, who sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ala Sayyidina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sallam, wa sallam, wa sallam, wa alaykum wa rahmatullah.